So bismillahirrahmanirrahim ahmaduhu wa usalli ala rasulil karim rabbi shahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa hlul uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli amin ya rabb So today inshallah we're going to talk about ruqya uh, from a different perspective you can say this is going to be more from a perspective of the preconditions of ruqya which is going to be i think for a lot of people, this will be very fascinating uh, because uh, it is, at least to me, quite mind-blowing, uh, some of the things that we'll be discussing today. So let's see how well I can explain the feelings in my heart in, in terms of its expression. So for let me start first from the Qur'an itself. Uh, let me start with Sutul Saad. So in Sutta Saad, there are different stories, and there are two stories simultaneously given in the Quran. And these two stories are of Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam and Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam. And there is a link between the two stories, and that is that Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam had control over the jinns. Whereas Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam was the shaitan had control over him. So in the first instance, Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam had control over the jinns. And in the second instance, Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam, he was, the, the shaitan was allowed to interfere with his life. But what is also interesting is in the way that he was allowed to interfere in his life. The way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave shaitan permission to interfere in Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam's life. So I'm going to start with these ayat from Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam. And then after discussing Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam, we will discuss Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam. And we will see this contrast, inshallah. So, بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّا سُلَيْمَانُ وَأَلْقَيْنَا عَلَىٰ كُرْسِهِ جَسَدًا And we tested Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam and we put over his chair a jasad. You can say a shaitan or the jal or some false entity. ثُمَّ anab And then he repented. And then he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a kingship that was never be given to anyone else. قَالَ رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي Oh Allah forgive me. وَهَبْ لِي مُلْكًا And give me a kingship. لَا يَنْبَغِي لِي أَحَدٍ مِّن بَعْدِي That is not going to be attained by anyone after me. وَإِنَّكَ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَحَابِ Indeed, you are the one who gives the gifts. Meaning this is very easy for you. If you want all these jinns, they can be in. Uh, you, you can give them to me in my control. After this, and this ayah number 36 will become important in today's discussion when we talk about the nature of the jinn. And we gave him in his control the wind. It would move by his permission in a gentle manner. Wherever he uh, directed the wind to go. And the shaitan was put in his control. So all the big, uh, I like the translation here, by the way. It uses the word demons. So you can say demons. So all the shayateen, but not just any shaitan. These were shaitan that were like the top of the hierarchy. And these were builders and these were divers. Divers in the earth and divers in the sea and builders on the earth. And builders in other ways, which I will talk about. Uh, probably later on if I remember and then there are other shayateen that he and those that really are bad including uh, the jal including uh, the one maybe he saw on his chair or it was the jal he put them all in chains and others that were fettered in chains. There were chains around their necks. 
Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Suleiman regarding his control, Hada this is my gift to you, my alta for you. Um famnun aw amsik hisab. You can receive them or punish them without or withhold them without any account. Inna lahu indana la zulfa wa husnul ma'ab. Indeed, Sulaiman was near us and he was very beautiful in his repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, as soon as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Sulaiman then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will now mention Ayyub And like I said, the contrast is that in one case, a Nabi of Allah has control over the shayateen. And in the second case, Allah is allowing the shaytan to test his servant, meaning Ayyub والسلام, by the shayateen. وَذْكُرْ أَبْدَنَا Ayyub, And remember our servant Ayyub. إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ When he, he called upon his Rabb, he called upon his Rabb saying what? إِنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الشَّيْطَانُ بِالنَّسْبِ وَعَذَابِ and indeed, shaitan has, uh, has uh, touched me. The word here, touch, is very important. If I have a chance, I may talk about that too. Inna masaniya shaytanu bi nusbi wa'adab. Nusb means hardship, as you see in the translation, has other meanings true. And adab means punishment and pain. Okay. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though he's tested, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him a solution. Ilkhas bi rijlik, stamp your feet. Hada muhtasilun baridun wa sharab. This is a washing, meaning the pure water that comes from the ground is one of the cures for the shayateen, which I might also again talk about if we have time. Hada muhtalisun baridun, it's cold wa sharab, any drink. وَهَبْنَا لَهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُ مَعَهُمْ رَحْمَةً مِنَّا وَذِكْرَ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ And of course, all the family that had left him and his friends that left him, Allah gave him double back. And this is a lesson for those who, uh, who have reflection. خُذْ بِيَدِكْ And take in your hand. And then it continues on his story. But the main point is what? That this is a story contrasting a servant of Allah who is control over shaitan and a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is tested by shaitan. So sometimes being tested by shaitan is the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on someone. Okay, so this is the first thing that I wanted to clarify. But uh, how did, <clears throat> how, what was the test Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam had? And this is really now going to go into the main points that I wanted to make for today. What was the type of touch of shaitan that uh, shaitan had on Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam? The type of test of Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam is the one of sickness. Because shayateen are allowed to create sickness. And this is very, very important because we live in a world of rising sickness. And therefore, there is a relationship between sickness and a relationship between people being sick and shaitan. And the other link between the story of Suleiman and the story of Ayyub is where it starts, meaning where does it start? Oh, Ayyub والسلام, got sick in his physical body because of the shaitan. And so this is the type of fitna where it starts at the individual with sickness, with disease. Okay. And it ends with shaitan taking control of a kingdom. Okay. So in the case of Suleiman, he tried to take, and there are many narrations on this, I don't have time to go over them, but if you look up any classical tafsir, they have some of those narrations where different narrations say different things, 
some narrations say that he actually took control and people thought it, he was Suleiman and he was giving judgments for a while. So he was trying to take control of the kingdom of Suleiman. You find these same words in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah. And they, shayateen, they recited to them regarding the kingship of Suleiman or the kingdom of Suleiman. The point being that uh, the problem of the shayateen begins with a person getting sick. This is, and, and if I was to look at it from the perspective of the time and the age we live in, it's when people start getting sick. And its ultimate climax is when shaitan actually takes control of society itself, meaning the shaitan takes control when human beings are not uh, at their best in terms of sickness. So this raises a lot of other questions, which I'm not going to go into that, you know, if a prophet of Allah is, if shaitan has some uh, attack on a prophet of Allah, how does that affect him in terms of Nabuwa, in terms of prophethood, um, there's a lot of discussion about this, but I'm going to skip that. Uh, the only thing I will say that is important to know in terms of Aqidah is that, of course, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends somebody as a messenger, as a Nabi to give his message, and of course, Nabis are not required to give the message in the same sense that a Rasul is. But a Nabi is, when he is saying, I'm a Nabi of Allah, he's representative of that message. And it is a requirement for the communicator, the message, the one who's giving the message, the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he is able to articulate that message and that he does not look, uh, you know, if Allah gave the message to an ugly person, that's not going to help people receive the message. So the prophets of Allah are generally good-looking, beautiful human beings, attractive, charming, good personalities, sharp, intelligent. They know how to carry a... They can understand human beings. They're empathetic and so on and so forth. So I want this just to be balanced with, as we're talking about uh, Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam. Okay, so it starts with people getting sick. And the ending is what? That uh, they try to take control over humanity in terms of kingdom. Okay, so I hope I'm clear about what I've said so far. So this contrast between Suleiman and Ayyub has at least two connections. Those of you that are smarter than me and have different experiences, you can maybe think of, okay, what are some other connections? The two connections being Suleiman was a servant of Allah who had control of the jinns. Ayyub والسلام, was a servant of Allah who was tested by the jinns or the shaitan. The other connection that it starts with human diseases. And this is also clarified in other ahadiths, which I'm going to come to in a second. So it starts with human diseases. And this human disease level exists even with at all times. But even in there, there's a variance when the disease is low, subtle, versus very high. Some companions of the Prophet, Sahabiya, for example, she got uh, we call it istihada, when the cycle of the blood is continuing and not stopping, the Prophet said, this is from the touch of shaitan. So again, so this is, you know, a shaitan yajrika majrad dam. Shaitan travels in the human body like blood. So he's always there, always trying to create problems. This is exactly what we're going to study today. Okay, now let me go on to my second point, which is the Quranic terminology used for the creation of the jinn. Okay, for this, I'm going to use this very interesting book, and this is what we're going to study. Now, this brother, he may be right or he may not be right, but definitely what he has said uh, deserves uh, thought. Okay. Uh, I tend to agree with him. It makes complete sense to me when you put all the ahadiths together. And let me tell you what that is. And then I will read to you from a part of this book. Okay. And that is that it seems when you study the Quran as well as the hadith of the Prophet, when you study what the Prophet called the food of the jinns, which we'll talk about in a little bit. When we talk, when we say, look at the hadith of the Prophet, a shaitan yajrika majrad dam, uh, shaitan travels in the body like blood. 
it seems when we look at the word of the Quran, uh, sumum, uh, he was made from the scorching wind of the fire. Okay, so one is the smokeless fire, which is the parsh portion that's on top of the fire that's really like a gas. Okay, it seems that shaitan is, uh, or the jinns are created from some sort of gas, and particularly carbon-based, because the human blood, the circulatory system in the human in the in our blood vessels has two components: the the red blood, the oxygen, and the carbon dioxide. Right, the taking in of oxygen and taking out of carbon dioxide from our body. Um, this seems to coincide with uh, what we know of the physical world and physical sciences. I'll tell you why this is significant. And but whether this is true or not, it's interesting, but it doesn't have a bearing on the other aspects that I'm going to talk about. So let me just uh, let's see if I can. Um, OK. So I'm just going to read this part. You can read from this book with me. It's called The Secrets of Angels, Demons, Satan and the Jinns. It's a very interesting book. Uh, the analysis above suggests the jinns, and I'm going to try to interview this brother and uh, um, try. I, I've sent him an email, and let's see what happens, inshallah. Uh, an explanation in light of science. The analysis above suggests that jinns are made from fire. This fire has the following characteristics. It is invisible to human beings. And then he quotes the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this word, jinan. And then he uses another word that I think is, uh, very important. And the jan, we created him before from fire of scorching wind. Minadin as sumum. Sumum is the scorching wind of that fire. Okay. So what is over there? Well, let's see what he says, right? Fire is usually created by burning wood, coal, gasoline, oil, or natural gas. When fuel burns, it produces hot gases. Hot gases consist of carbon dioxide and steam and from the flame of fire. Carbon dioxide is an invisible gas. It is carbon dioxide gas that gives fizz to soft drinks. By the way, keep this in mind, the soft drinks and carbon relationship. Maybe you want to jot it down in case we don't get back to it, but then you already got the point in a sense. Hot steam is dry and invisible. So real hot steam is dry and invisible, not wet. The steam we see coming out of boiling water is not really steam. It's condensed water mist in steam. Most fuels have solids and give off carbon particles upon burning. The heat of the flame makes the carbon particle glow. It is this glow that gives the flame its color. The same carbon particles form soot, which is the ash. Okay, at the end, upon cooling and make the flame smoky. Thus, if we could remove the carbon particles from the flame, the flame would not, would not, would not only be smoke-free, it will also be invisible. The invisible smoke-free flame will therefore only consist of carbon dioxide gas and steam. Now, he makes some interesting points further. So I'm going to read this further, even if it's a little bit boring. But let's see if I can... Okay. So I'm skipping to the second page where he says the jinns will be explained in a later chapter can climb up to seven, an altitude of 60 to 70 miles. Why? Because that's the altitude from which the meteorites hit the earth. Okay. So that's how far they're able to go. Coincidentally, also carbon dioxide goes up to that level too. So these two things he tries to connect that carbon dioxide goes up to 70, 80 is 70 miles in the air and the 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 jinns are also allowed to go up to that uh, up to the atmosphere where uh from where the meteorites so the meteorites come at, at into the atmosphere at that very point from where carbon dioxide itself comes to an end in the atmosphere in, in the earth's atmosphere so he makes this as a point uh so he says on the second paragraph carbon dioxide stays in gaseous form up up to an altitude of 70 miles. It cannot be converted into liquid or solid at, at the temperature and pressure ranges in which the jinns dwell. We can therefore state 
that of the two gaseous states that make invisible smoke-free flame of fire, only carbon dioxide gas maintains its invisibility and in dwelling in the region of the jinns. So this is kind of like the uh, main point I wanted to take from him. And if one, what you can, we can have two positions on this. One is to tend to agree with this, which is what I'm doing for now. But the other is that uh, just keep it in the back of your mind if at another time something clicks or may not click. Now, why is this interesting? Okay, this becomes interesting because I will now add more points to this. He added these points, but I'm going to add some more points to this that I think are also interesting. Number one, uh, that what did the Prophet say? The Prophet said, let me actually go and show you the narrations. So let's look at them one by one, and then we will discuss them, okay? Uh, let's start with the narrations here, okay? So this is about istihada. Uh, istihada, when, is the, when the blood flow of the lady is more than uh, the normal number of days, and then after that, she still continues to pray after, after her normal days um, go by. I said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, okay, so this continues. Fatima, the daughter of Abu Habesa, had a blood flow uh, for a certain period and did not pray. The Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, uh, glory be to Allah, this comes from the devil. So there is, you know, the literal interpretation would be that the, there's something in the person's blood flow that uh, that the shaitan has an access to and he is causing this blood flow to continue when it should normally have stopped. This is very common amongst uh, women. Okay. Another narration that are there many of these narrations. The Prophet ﷺ said, the devil flows in a man like his blood. Okay. And so for the brother that was trying to make the link with carbon, this is carbon, uh, carbon dioxide or carbon makes sense because we have carbon in our uh, blood flow. And you'll see this becomes uh, now another aspect that is very, very important. And that is the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that yawning is from the devil. So when any of you yawns, he should try to restrain himself from yawning. Why? Now, you'll see that there are two things, right? There's oxygen and then carbon dioxide. Human beings, we, scientists don't know why we yawn. No one knows why human beings yawn. And if you're ever in prayer, you may have noticed that when you're praying and you yawn, the person by you yawns, or maybe he yawns first and then you yawn, right? And so it's contagious. The reason we're supposed to be yawning is because there's lack of oxygen. So the body wants to take in oxygen. But the prophet is telling us that, that what? that yawning is from shaitan. Why is it from shaitan? Because the, the, the body has a lack of oxygen, which is very important for the human body, of course, which I'm going to come to in a little bit. But the human body is trying to give itself oxygen. And this is partly due to the fact that shaitan, and this is the part of what I'm trying to say, is that this is partly due to the fact that shaitan himself is carbon-based. But from a purely scientific perspective, we don't know why we yawn. And the Prophet said, yawning is from shaitan. So there are three categories here. Yawning is from shaitan. Nabi Muhammad said this. Scientifically, we don't know why we do this. But the guess is to get more oxygen. And then the third point, which is uh, com combining these two points, which is that when you yawn, the effect of shaitan is there because when the body feels lack of oxygen, it is perhaps because of this carbon-based entity. Okay. Now let's look at the other narrations of the Prophet ﷺ on this issue. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Um, okay. Now, this is about the carbon-based um, food. Uh, 
the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, bring me stones in order to clean myself, clean my private parts. Do not bring me bones or animal dung. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu went on narrating. So I brought some stones, carrying them in the corner of my robe till I put them by his side and went away. When he finished, he walked with, I walked with him and asked, what about the bone and the animal dung? He said, they're the food of the jinns. The delegate of the jinns uh, came to me and uh, how nice those jinns were and asked me for the remains of the human fo food meaning uh when you finish eating bones particularly you should leave them in a place for the jinns to have and that's actually a great thing to do uh to to like you give bird uh, you know you may give bread to bird or you give some food to different animals you can do this for the jinns if you want but again this is all about being carbon based Okay, so I invoked Allah for them and they would never pass by a bone or animal dung, but find food on them. Okay, so the jinns, again, uh, very important for me to mention this. Um, the upper part of the human body, the lungs and everything is dealing with the breathing process, right? And where does shaitan go? Shaitan goes where there's najis. So where's the najis? Uh, one of the great scholars of Islam, Mujad al-Fasani, he said that one of the reasons, let me show this to you. Um, one of the He said one of the reasons that we put our hands here or wherever you put your hands, but around this rib, under this rib cage a area is because the area under that is najis meaning has you know feces and that is all there inside your body right so where does shaitan he's in the bathroom why because of feces and urine and in your body there's an area that is also carrying feces now i'll tell you something very interesting uh they did a surgery where this is this everybody knows this meaning this is this is highly accepted this is why i'm going to talk about this area of the body that before you know you're even like reading Quran on someone or before you're like like doing Rukia itself, there's certain toxins you have to get rid of that have to do with this area. And so this is why I'm talking about this relationship with carbon, but it's not necessarily it's not necessary for this to, for the rest of this to be true, for that to be true, meaning they're not interconnected, but it's just an, an important point if it's true. And if it's not important point, then or if it's not true, then the rest of it still stands. So this part of the human body, the gut, right? This is like the second brain. This is what they call it. Uh, they call the gut system the second brain. Uh, let me just see if I can show you this uh, very quickly. Um, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Uh, the gut. Okay. Uh, because of the nervous system relies on some type of neurons, neurotransmitters that are found in the central nervous system, some medical experts call it, meaning the gut, the second brain. Okay. And they've done these experiments, which I can also show you, where they took the um, the feces of one person and put it into the feces into the into the gut of the other person what happened that person started to act like the first person that person started to have the same act you know if he was very active they became very active if they were very calm they were calm they took the feces of one person put it on the other person and that changed their entire attitude Okay, so now what is the relationship between blood, where shaitan travels, and the gut? So this is like kind of like what I'm getting at, okay? And I also made the point with Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam, which is the main point that I made, which is um, <clears throat> gut, like your intestines, okay? So the, the main point I made with Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam, which is that shaitan can bring in diseases so whether it is uh you know all these diseases that uh, that are out there everything even from cancer to uh covid to whatever it may be out there that uh, shaitan can be spreading this right and so 
Okay. Um, now, let me show you this so that uh, you, let me see if I can bring this up, even though it's kind of like disgusting, but I want to make this point. Uh, uh, how do I put this? Uh, putting, uh, how do you put, how do you spell feces into another person's body effect? Uh, so this is what they do. They do fecal transplant, which is to put poop from one person to the other person to change their mood, okay? So uh, let me see if I can say, so this will make the point, um, could fecal transplants help treat mental illness? So you have one person who uh, is normal and another person who is mental illness, schizophrenia, multiple personality, all sorts of these gin related issues. You take the fecal of the person that's normal and take out the fecal of the person who's not normal and put the normal into the one who's not normal. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, he's cured. How does that happen? Because this is, like I said, when in salah, you make this kind of like bordering boundary. And this is what Mujahid Sani Rahmatullah he said, that the boundary between the upper part of the human body and the lower part of the human body, when you tie your hands, is because the upper part is more ennobling. And the lower part carries the najas, carries the those aspects of you that, that is, attracts shaitan into you. Because every person is a bathroom in a sense that when you go to the bathroom, that's where shaitan is and you know what you do there. So it's that is also there, but then also in your body that th this is why when you want to eat, you can purify that whole system when you say bismillah. You can also purify that whole system by eating with your right hand and not eating with your left hand and making sure that there's one hand that only used for good things, and one hand that's used for other things so that you're not by mistake taking any parasites or anything bad into your body that will then go into your gut. And so there's this body-gut connection that even though shaitan affects your mind, but he brings in diseases at this level of what you eat. Right? This is very important. And so it's very important that what you eat is good because it will affect what is happening in the mind. And so uh, uh, somebody said question. Uh, yeah, I guess you can ask me a question. I'll take one or two questions before I go further, but I have a lot more to discuss. So uh, we have to, I, I'll take one or two questions if somebody wants to ask me one or two questions, that's fine. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. This is Shabir from Bangladesh. I, I just had a very small question uh, uh, regarding diatomaceous earth. So yes. I have actually found uh, two people who are very close to me. And uh, so basically I've done an initial analysis and I, it seems to me that both have been having uh, stomach issues for a long, long time, like a bloated stomach uh, and have been and also have been sleeping at night where they perhaps uh, yell a little bit, which is probably another sign of, say, for example, the, the shayateen perhaps attacking. So, uh, you know, I, I sort of recommended uh, and, and have given them diatomaceous earth uh, mm. by mixing it with water. And uh, I've been regularly asking them and they both have answered that, uh, you know, uh, from the, you know, the bloated perspective, I mean, they don't have that bloatness anymore. They don't feel bloated. And their their stomach issues have reduced drastically, um, and and when I mixed it with uh, with uh, vitamin B three uh, niacin, uh, in one of the persons, a very close relative of mine, he, he stopped uh, coughing. I mean, he was he was coughing a lot, 
but but somehow and this is this is real example in front of my eyes that i'm seeing so i just wanted to mention this point yeah and that's a good i was going to actually come to those issues uh if i had time and that is that if you clean out the toxins and if you clean out the gut because the diet it's hard for me to say because of my dyslexia the the thing the brother was talking about the earth the diametrius earth i think it's called when you eat that what does it do it get rid of the toxin it get rid of the parasites I'm going to talk a little bit about that because when you get rid of this, this is where shaitan is sitting. He sits with your food. This is why the Prophet said, وسلم, that a believer eats with one stomach and a disbeliever eats with seven stomachs. Rather, what is the word the Prophet used? Not stomachs. The word the Prophet used was intestines, the gut. This is what the Prophet said. The believer eats with one gut and the disbeliever eats with seven guts. Meaning what? When you're hungry, are you hungry because your body is hungry? Or are you hungry because the parasite in you is taking away the nutrients from you? And now your body is saying, I'm hungry, but not because you would have been hungry, but because this parasite. And by the way, uh, I don't think uh, a lot of us understand this, but a large number, every, about 80% of the human beings have some sort of parasites in them. And it is in these parasites that shaitan sits. And it is in these bacterias of the gut uh, that shayateen sit. And in fact, um, you know, so this is the reason to say bismillah is to put a defense because then if you say bismillah to something and even if it's going through your uh, gut tract, then shaitan can't eat that because it has the name of Allah in it. Unless maybe he's Muslim then he can take partake from that. But he won't because he's a Muslim and doesn't want you to ha not have your nutrients, which is why when you have eat b bones or eat chicken or eat whatever and you have bones, leave out, don't throw it away in the najas, don't throw it away in the trash can because then the Muslim jinns, they won't be able to eat. They don't want to be near najas. They don't want to be near uh, dirty things. So if you throw it in a way, and so what you do is you leave it out for you know like a day or two and then you throw it after that in the garbage can, okay? So this is a very important point, and this is where I was coming, is that the reason your Quran is not effective is because we have gotten ourselves into a situation where they put the disease in us. And they put the disease in us, and after putting the disease in us, they can leave and come as they like. Before, if your gut is good, and they want to affect you, they have to come inside you. Well, come inside me. And I'm going to read a lot of Quran and you're going to burn. But if they have a way of putting things in, throwing things inside you, that'll cause all sort of bipolar, schizophrenia, different manic depressions in you, it's going to be hard to get that shaitan until you clear the toxins. So this is really where, but it's much, much more than that. And so this is what I want to get into the nitty gritty of, inshallah. Um, I think Sister Hiba. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. So I want to um, I want to clarify the bones, uh, the chicken bones or meat bones that we eat, um, because I feel like in past lessons you've said you've emphasized actually to throw them out, because leaving them around would attract jinn to the house. So if yes, so there are two three things. Number one. Um, there's a there there's a difference among scholars about how to actually treat the bones, right? So this is the thing: if there are Muslim jinns around you, then you want to give them the bones. Meaning, the jinns that came to the Prophet sallam, they were which jinns? They were the good jinns or the bad jinns? They were the good jinns. So for them, you want to leave the bones. If you feel around you are negative jinns with negative energy, then it's better just to get it because you don't want them to eat, and so they may even eat something good just to get some nutrition, if you're saying Bismillah and you're not allowing them to take from you, then they might want to take from other places. And on that same subject, it's also very important to say Bismillah or A'udhu Billah when you close the fridge door. Like food, nutrition should be closed. If we have the habit of just throwing the bones out, can we just say Bismillah, throw the bones out in the trash? Do you think that's just a safe? That will disturb the good Muslim jinns because if in the trash, well, okay, if you put it in a special bag and throw it in the trash, that won't bother the Muslim jinns. But if you if you throw it in and it touches najas of some sort, 
If it doesn't touch nudges, then it's fine. If it touches nudges, then they're not going to want to eat from it. Okay. But like as a practice generally, or like are Muslims generally supposed to like think about this? Like in your own life, do you think about each this? Person like will have to, each person will have to do it differently. Okay. You know, um, some scholars, they uh, were very adamant about leaving the bones for the jinns to eat from. Other scholars were very like, I dare you to do this. Like some of the scholars, this, were, I dare. Go ahead. Is it more about like if you're being affected? By yes. Or if you're challenging them. Okay. If you are challenging them, then you're like, you know, here's a bone. Come, let me see which one of you. I'm giving an example of a specific scholar I know. So, yeah. All right. Inshallah. Okay. Yeah. Bismillah. Okay. So I was saying. Um, let me see how I want to explain this. Now, in terms of the, in terms, let me go ahead and do this. Oh yeah, okay, here it is. So the role of the gut biome and diet in depression, for example, okay? Um, having a good, good uh, bacteria and good things in your, in your gut uh, help with, for example, bipolar disorder the link between depression and your gut, okay? So what I'm trying to get at is for people to understand there's a relationship between what you're eating and what's in your gut and what's happening in your brain. And the extreme example I gave was the feces transplant, okay? And what you want to do, and really where I'm taking all of this, is that in order to attack shaitan, you have to get rid of the toxins. And probably the best thing for that is the, is the, is the one that the brother mentioned, the Diametrius earth, or other, other people have mentioned other things, and people have to just kind of like try this for a few weeks and try that for a few weeks and see what, what works for them. Um, I haven't figured those things out yet. I'm still in the process of uh, doing that. Okay. so. Um, I'm wondering if I should play one of these videos just for you all to get an understanding. But I think it's clear from the titles that you're seeing that there is a relationship between the gut and uh, depression, bipolar, all these different, um, uh, you know, uh, feelings that people can have and that how your brain and gut are interconnected, which takes us to another huge topic, which I'm not going to talk about today, which is that very important nerve. Uh, I forget what that nerve is called. It's like the most important nerve that goes throughout your body. Um, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. I don't remember right now, but it has to do with stress. So these things are like all interconnected. Okay, so now let's go to my next uh, point. Uh, vagus vein. Yeah, vagus nerve. That's right. I think that's, that's, that's what it's called. Yeah. So um, now, the, so I'm going to leave that for another time. But all these things are interconnected. And what shaitan has done is, this is what shaitan has done. Shaitan has given us the biggest poisons to make our gut bad and to make our brain bad. What are those poisons? It is bleached uh, sugars, uh, bleached bread, wheat, uh, uh, fake salt, not Himalayan pink salt, for example, the normal white salt, which is bleached white. These things are like, there. so, so th there, there are a few things happening. Number one, you don't have the, you're not taking in the food that the Quran calls halal and tayyib, the pure food, right? That's halal and tayyib. You're taking in food that is artificial and even poisonous and that's going into your gut and even though you're saying bismillah at that level right but if you're saying bismillah and eating a poison what do you expect to happen so this is the situation we're in we're in a situation where we're saying bismillah but we're eating foods that are not halal and tayyib and so that has an impact and we're inundated with it to the point that no one can really escape it and so um on that point now, let me mention a few other things that I think are important. Like, let me show you. Um, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Okay, let me show you, for example, this book. 
just as an example, okay? Grain brain, okay? The surprising truth about wheat, carbs, and sugar. Why carbs? Partly because carbs are the most genetically manipulated uh, food that we eat. Your brain silent killers. So now they're bad for your gut and they're bad for your brain. And so what is shaitan? Shaitan doesn't have to try very hard to get to you. It's all happening through bad food. And, you know, the Quran is uh, very clear about this. If I can show you this verse of the Quran, inshallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah about this issue, about the link between food and shaitan. Ya ayuhan nas, O mankind, kulu mimma fil ard, eat from whatever is in the earth, halal and tayyiba. Eat of the halal and tayyib. Tayyib is that food that which Allah made, not that was... Uh, like uh, what do you can say? Uh, an apple, Allah made an apple. Okay, uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala didn't make um, what is it called? D uh, chips, those named layman chips or detrays. Uh, I don't know how to say it. So uh, because of my dyslexia, I'm having a hard time saying it. But you know, some brand name, something that human. So it's not halal and tayyib. Right, Ya Yuhannas Kulu and Kulu here is a command. Eat, you must eat. Mima fil ard. Kulu, you must eat from whatever is from the earth. Halal and tayyib. That's halal and tayyib. Because over here, let me just add a philosophical twist to this. Okay, that is that man is made from the soil and the extract of the soil. And what is the reality of that is that that the, the nutrients of man come from soil. So you're either, the, the tree comes out of the soil. So either the animal is eating the tree and then the animal that's the one that eats the meat, I forget how to say it, uh, he, uh, he eats that animal, okay? So there's an animal that eats the tree. Uh, I'm having a hard time remembering how to say those words. And then there's the animal that eats the meat. And so, this all goes back to the soil. And this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to, uh, to the jinns. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks them this question in Surah Al-Safat. Uh, let me share that with you. It's a very interesting and very important uh, point um, that I want to share with you. Um, In ayah number 11, Allah says, فَاسْتَفْتِهِمْ Ask them, meaning the jinns, ask them, أَهُمْ أَشَدُّ خَلْقًا Are they a more difficult creation? أَمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا Or is the one that we created? إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاهُ We created him, meaning the man. مِنْ طِينِ اللَّهِ From a sticky clay. And that sticky clay is from where your nutrients come. And that sticky clay is what makes you أَشَدُّ خَلْقًا the more severe creation, meaning the more thing that has that is stronger creation. It is that over here the translation inquire them, are they more difficult to create or the or the others we created? We created them from sticky clay. This more difficult is one translation, but it's not, I don't think, the best. Ashaddu khalqan means more severe in, in creation, not in the sense of difficulty, but that the creation itself, meaning the human being itself, is a stronger creation. فَاسْتَفْتِهِمْ أَهُمْ أَشَدُّ خَلْقًا O Prophet, ask them, meaning the jinns, أَهُمْ أَشَدُّ خَلْقًا Are you a great, greater creation or a stronger creation? أَمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا The jinn is created from a subtle creation, from fire. إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاهُمْ مِنْ طِينِ اللَّهِ We created them, meaning the human beings, from sticky clay. And all your nutrients are supposed to come from clay. All your food, all your everything comes from the clay. And that coming, the food that comes from the clay is halal, is the tayyib food. It may not be halal until, uh, meaning it's not going to be halal until you do zabiha. So halal and tayyib. And very important, the food is zabiha. And very important, it's tayyib. And what we've done is we've completely compromised tayyib food for artificial food. And we're more interested in the zabiha food than the tayyib food. But we live in a time where Tayyib food is just as important as halal food. And so what happens when you take all these sugars? Now, I'll give you an example. It imbalances everything. 
and you become a soft target. You become a target for shaitan to affect very, very easily, even though if you took care of all the toxins, of all the parasites, and all the heavy metals, and if you took care of all the toxins, and then you were read to, to read Quran, it would be a very powerful, because there's nowhere for him to hide. He can't hide in that bacteria or virus, or he can't hide in that parasite. He can't he can't hide in your feces because you're saying bismillah. He can't hide there. And you're eating the right thing. So it has the right effect on your mind. It's not easy. His waswasa would, would, would you know, if, if because your mind is imbalanced. So now he has to do a little bit of waswasa to have a big effect. Instead of being in a situation where he has to do a lot of waswasa to have a little bit of effect. So this is the situation we're in. And so now let me go back to the document I had. Because I have a lot to discuss, and let's see. So, um, so I went through some of these. I'll just go through these very quickly to like uh, give an overview. The devil flows like uh, in a man like blood, and I was referring to carbon again. This also referring to carbon, the yawning of the devil. So when one of you yawns, you should try to restrain himself. This is about the narration about the istihada. Um, this uh, is. Um, same. Okay. Wadu again. What is wadu related to? It's related to the gut, right? And what happens when the wind passes? One of the things that comes out is carbon dioxide. And so wind passing is, is or the breaking of wadu is related to this passing of the carbon dioxide and is related to the, because the gas is made in the gut. So, and you're not in a state of tahara anymore. You lose your tahara once the uh, the the gas leaves, okay. And what does the Prophet say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about the food of the jinns, about the bone that and the animal dung, which you can use as fuel also, uh, that they are foods for the jinns, okay. Now, of course, uh, I can show you a whole documentary of how carbon dioxide and oxygen both work in the blood, just like the Prophet said, a shaitan yajrika majrad dam. Then I talked about Prophet Ayyub wasalam, and the many different traditions that relate to sickness and shaitan and how he causes sickness and how shayateen are causing sickness all over the place. You know, starting with what we eat, shaitan, bacteria in your gut. And I talked about the stance we have in salah. Your gut is your second brain. And then I was talking a little bit about parasites. This is a whole discussion in itself. But uh by the way, I want to share with you something that's very interesting in this regard, and that is that the uh, when there is a full moon, as you know, the Prophet ﷺ used to fast in the full moon. What does fasting do? Fasting stops you from giving energy to the parasites and to the negative things. And the parasites die out because you're not giving them food. But if you fast and you eat like it's Eid, then what will happen? Then you're not killing them, really, right? You're not really killing them. But if you eat normally, and they're they're ask they're making you hungry because they've taken away your nutrients and 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 now you're supposed to make them wait longer so that you know becomes difficult. So if you fast, especially, and I'm not saying this, the one of the foremost, I don't know how to say his name, but that doctor uh, said, you know, one of the best ways to do is to fast three days. If you fast three days, you start getting rid of these par parasites. And then he was, you know. He wasn't talking about Islam, so you said, well, you might have to increase it for a whole week. But what's interesting is this, that you know how the Prophet ﷺ fasted in the days of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the full moon, right? And so the relationship between uh, parasites and full moon is very interesting because... Um, Full moons and parasites in your body. What happens is when there's a full moon, because everything is liquid, your body is liquid. So this is when the parasites uh, are more active in the full moon. And this is when the parasites are more, um, you know, affecting a person. And it's not uncommon to uh, get an anecdotal evidence of oh, it's going to be a full moon and the kids are going to act up in class. I mean, these are things people have experienced. Uh, so it is estimated upwards of 70% of people have 
parasitic in infestations that they can manifest as various symptoms. Now, if Shaitan comes to you and he sees you have parasites and he sees not enough, and this is where I was going to talk about carbon dioxide and oxygen. I may not have time, but if not enough oxygen is going to your brain, which is what they did in COVID. They put this mask on you that was going to like reduce your oxygen by 16%. In fact, I'm going to show you this book written by, I think this sister she's a doctor she she's a she's a, a full doctor and she wrote this book on gins that i was like surprised like wow a muslim sister wrote like this because if you read her like she's very like you know very traditionally uh her mindset there are thousands of different types of species uh 30 percent i'm microscopic okay so now what is its relationship with uh these uh i don't know how to say this word right now today i'm really being affected by this uh these rhythms affect all of us during the full moon. We naturally produce less uh, melatonin and more, more uh, serotonin, which these spec uh, pesky pathogens are attracted to. And so they get more affected. So anyway, so there's a relationship between this situation and what? And fasting in the middle of the three months in the full moon. Um, okay, now let me... Uh, can we have the title of the book, please? Yeah, so I'm going to share that with you, inshallah, right now. The, uh, the one was the book that I talked about here. Um, the title is uh, Secrets of Angels, Demons, Satan, and the Jinns, Decoding the Nature Through uh, Quran and Science. Okay, and uh, then uh, the other book, uh, let me see if I can go through my tabs very quickly and find it. Let me just X out the stuff I already went through. Um, Hello, Ms. Sunniana Muhammad. Okay, I already did this. Here, um, I'll just go over this as I'm trying to find the, the other book that I'm going to talk about. The newspaper said that researchers suggest that salt may act as a natural antidepressant, which is another thing, by the way. We don't have enough salt, proper salt, real salt in our bodies. We have this bleached, ionized version. And salt is very important uh, for normal health and mental health and so you see with the sugar with the salt with all these other foods that are not real foods you're just giving shape on the open doorway that come into me and affect me and so this and and you'll see where where inshallah i take this so you know this is about salt and it's 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 by the way the sunnah of the prophet one of the uh it's not very authentic but Either way, it's it's true from this perspective, 100%, that in many of the Islamic uh, cities or, or civilizations, they used to pass salt around the house for everyone just to take a little bit of salt. And there are some narrations the Prophet used to do that, and some narrations the companions the Prophet used to do that. But whether those narrations are authentic or not, but the Hakims of the Muslim world they definitely gave this importance that to have natural salt inside you, which we have now stopped doing. It's not our tradition anymore to, I mean, in America, they do say, pass me the salt, but the salt they pass is the one that's bleached. It's not real salt. Close tab. Okay. Let me, I'll practice that. Inshallah. Okay. Now, uh, where are we? Okay. Um, so everything that I'm talking about is relating to uh, mental illness and how shaitan takes advantage of it. Common use of dietary supplements for bipolar. Uh, we can just skip this for today. This is just an example of people with bipolar disorder that if they just take some natural 
foods, right? They take some natural foods like omega and these different uh, uh, supplements. Uh, what will happen? Their brain will become balanced. If they sleep right, if they sleep right, their brain will become balanced. All these things that, you know, where people have multiple personality, they're hearing voices. So I'm going to look for this person's book, but let me just see this. Have actual neurotransmitter effectiveness, but they're also having, uh, helping to un Okay, this oxidative stress is very, very important to understand in this whole process of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the human blood. I want to end with maybe that if I get a chance. Uh, let me see if I can show that to you. I'm going to show that to you first right now. So watch this video now. This is very interesting, right? That how all these things are interrelated. What you eat creates oxidative stress, which means that it reduces the oxygen in you. It creates stress in you. And because you're not eating the right foods and even the drugs that they give us, right, uh, to, to cure us have this same problem. So just watch this video. is a state of the body in which there is an excess of free radicals present. A free radical is a molecule in an unusual state because it's missing an electron. In stability, it takes an electron from a nearby molecule. This can happen in any part of the cellular structure, for example, in the cell membrane or within DNA. Because that second molecule is now unstable, it in turn needs to regain its stability by taking electrons from another molecule. Now, a domino effect of electron stealing begins. Without mediation, this process can lead to the destruction of cellular structures, in this case, the cell membrane. Free radicals are produced naturally throughout the body as byproducts of cellular metabolic processes. Therefore, our cells come equipped with the molecules to get rid of these free radicals, the problem comes when there is an excess of free radicals and our cells can no longer keep up. This is called oxidative stress load. Examples of free radicals include reactive oxygen species, which are a group of electron stealing molecules that include oxygen in their chemistry. Some of these species are hydrogen peroxide, hypochlorous acid, and nitric oxide. So what type of factors cause the body to have an imbalanced load of oxidative stress? Smoking, excessive exercise, poor diet, excess drinking, radiation, UV light, pollutants, and toxins. If the continuous domino effect of stealing electrons were to continue with no intervention, cells would eventually disintegrate and organs would fail. Oxidative stress can also lead to chronic inflammation response and an inappropriate upregulation of the immune system. So this is another element to all of this, which is that uh, the, the, the stress of not getting the right type of, uh, or, or this kind of like imbalance of oxygen in the human body is definitely a, a problem. Now, I want to share with you this verse of the Quran very quickly. 
where shaitan makes an oath to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I will eat, read the part that's easy for me to read right now because my dyslexia is really like affecting me. And I will command them to what slit the ears of the cattle. Why? Because they slit the ears and use that for DNA. I'm not going to go into that right now. And I will command them, shaitan says. That they will change the creation of Allah. So this is what we've done. We've taken the halal and tayyib, changed it. Who did Shaitan did this. Why did Shaitan do this? Because when that goes into your body, that will give him access to you. He will be able to hide behind those non tayyib things that are that because that's like nudges in your body where he can hide inside that nudges. And whoever takes shaitan as his friend or his ally, mindunihi, other than him, faqad khasira khusranam mubina. Indeed, he has had the greatest loss. Okay, let us continue. Uh, let's see. Uh, so here's another example. Just natural things. Rapid recovery from major depression using magnesium. What happens? This is another very important relationship. Again, I, I had a lot in my mind to discuss, but I think I'm going to just cut it short because you, what carries oxygen? Your blood cells. What do your blood cells need? They need B12. What do you need for your mental health? B12. What does your blood cells need? They need iron, right? So what happens is when shaitan is inside you, you have all this junk. And then on the and then what shaitan is trying to do as a result, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a second, is trying to create an imbalance of your oxygen, which is extremely that's life itself. And when your your brain has lack of oxygen, your the baby of the pregnant mother has lack of oxygen, then that has an effect upon them in various ways, including uh, autism and so on and so forth. Um, okay, let's continue. So these natural supplements, natural things like magnesium, and it's not enough to take a vitamin that says, oh, I have magnesium and you take it because it doesn't mean that it's going to get absorbed by your body. So you have to do it in a way that is uh, effective by natural foods or by, I guess, research to see what is the absorption level of of that particular vitamin company. A fluorate is especially promising for a depression if lithium uh, is is less. That's another example of just something very basic. Um, let's see. I'm trying to get to this book here. Oh, this is very important. Again, this is another aspect of the whole thing, which has to do with the wheat and the carbs we eat. They're all genetically manipulated. How? Well, when you, we used to eat whole grain 50, 60 years ago, and that had the three parts. It had the bran, the endosperm, and germ. And now we have the refined grain, in, which is the, uh, and, and on top of that, we do other things to it to process it. But the refined grain doesn't have those parts that, and, and, and so as a result, we're eating things that, you know, are really compromising our health. Okay, let's see what we have here. Again, this is just about uh, uh, vitamins. Uh, taking probiotics for your gut health, that is definitely a good thing someone can do. Sugar is poison. Uh, this is another thing. Sugar is very, very bad. And it's very addictive, you know. Uh, I'm trying to get to. This is the doctor. Now I'll show you her books. Okay. Uh, one of her books is Infertility Caused by Oxygen, uh, by Decreased Oxygen Utilization in Demon. I'm trying to get her uh, interview by her too. Disease and as an Explanation of Sins. Of course, we know certain things are definitely related because alcohol, pork, uh, homosexuality, these are all things that lead to disease. 
and the and the disease leads to shaitan having control over you so all these things are you know cancer is a, a jinn possession this is what this doctor she feels the ultimate cure uh the divine cure of coronavirus and widespread diseases and uh again uh, for her it was all about your lifestyle and what you eat and not disobeying allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so uh let me uh the author's bio so i'd like to also interview this sister you know uh dr mira is an associate professor she's a gynecologist and in vitro fertilization consultant from paris so she would be like an excellent person who has this perspective to interview for me at least it would be great to interview her inshallah so uh okay let's see where we are now so you know fasting during the three days where the jinn can use and hide in parasites jinns cause disease like ayub alayhi case jinns can use and hide in bacteria and virus parasites heavy metals if you're getting rid of toxins you first get rid of parasites then you get rid of the heavy metals then you get rid of the other toxins then i talked about the oxidative stress and then so therefore now once the person's gone through this cleansing, number one, they fix their aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And number two, they remove the toxins. So reading Quran during and after doing this, after getting the, meaning making sure that they have the proper aqidah and removal of toxins, everything from parasites to heavy metals to whatever is in the body. Now, when you read Quran on the person, that jinn has nowhere to hide in that person. There's no najas inside that person's body that the shaitan can hide. The shait, as soon as you read Quran on that person, the, the jinn will be captured by the uh, wave or the energy of the Quran. It will directly affect him. He'll have no defense mechanism. But what's happening is because everything from we're not breathing correctly to we're not eating properly, we're not sleeping properly, we're just... It's like shaitan has us killed and just just trying to make us his host, really, just at, at a grand global scale. Just everything is there to make us into zombies. And so, you know, and then we have to fight this off. And so, um, oh, the book, I, I mentioned the book's name, didn't I? Uh, let me see if I can do that again. Um, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. So, I think. Mm, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Um, I will have to find that. Yes. Okay, so let me give you. So these are the names of the books. Infertility caused by decreased oxygen. So that's what's happening. And by the way, decreased oxygen also happens because of... What's that thing they do to see inside the stomach of the baby um, when they do the... Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Today, shaitan's really playing with my mind. Um, when you can't... Uh, when, when you have that instrument to see if it's a boy or girl. That also, by the way, uh, has an effect. Disease on the Expiation of Sins is the second book she wrote. And then uh, Cancer is a Jinn Possession Ultimate Cure. We had one brother here who was an engineer. Uh, I, uh, he, sorry, he's a lawyer from England. He also talked about cancer being uh, the cure of cancer. And what was his cure? Get rid of sugar. Get rid of these things. Start eating right. And, and that was his cure. And that was a Muslim brother who cured himself. The divine cure of coronavirus and widespread diseases. And in this, the author, she goes over like all of these, you know, West Nile, all these diseases that have spread. And all of this is like the, the work of the shayateen. And she references uh, bin Halima in, in, her, in her book also. So, um, yeah. That's uh, everything I wanted to say. So now I would like to know what you all have to say in response to what I had to say. And 
what your feedback is. So maybe we can take questions and answers for about five minutes or so. And then inshallah, I have to go. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyidi. Wa alaikum as salam, yes, Sayyidi. Alhamdulillah. We, uh, we look forward to seeing you, inshallah, at Dar Rahma. I know the boys at your masjid, they wanted to challenge us to a wrestling match. So inshallah, we're ready. Tell them to bring it on. Okay. So. <laughs> the boys at our masjid um, challenged your masjid? Yeah. That's what one of the brothers at the masjid told me. So I oh. told him we're ready. So who did you talk to, Brother Basha? Brother Brother Bilal. Oh, Brother Bilal. Okay. I, I don't know which uh, I don't know who said it at your masjid, but he told me that the brothers at your masjid they wanted to challenge us to a wrestling match. So yeah, I mean we have you. we have mashallah some heavy hitters. Let's put it that I, way. I know we're we're lacking over here, but inshallah we'll be ready. <laughs> um, Alhamdulillah. But one a uh, couple of things. One to uh combat the um eating uh food that is toyib. One mm. of the ways you can do that is eat food that is in season. Like right now, the uh the pumpkins, the gourds, the the um the different squash, those are all in season right now. So it's it's best to eat those right now. So that, okay, that's yeah, one that's way to that's a very good point. And, you know, my knowledge on these things is very, very poor, subhanAllah. It's like almost unforgivable. But, yeah, that's a very good point to eat food in the season. Yes. And then uh, also another uh, another element that can be added to combat these different ailments and diseases is oxygen. Yes. Um, another, there, there are a few different ways to get oxygen. Because like you were mentioning in the beginning, our bodies are made up of, of essentially four main components, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and carbon. Mm. So one of the, like you said, one of the ways we get oxygen through the body is through the blood. That's mm. the main component. So to increase the oxygen flow, we do different things like breathing deeply that will increase the oxygen flow. Also, uh, hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2 because it has that extra molecule, molecule of oxygen in it. So mm. if, you, if you go out and you buy the 35% full grade hydrogen peroxide, you can actually mm. actually mix this with your water and drink it. And this will increase the uh, oxygen in the blood. And it will also help get rid of, you know, ailments, different pathogens in the body. Can you actually text that to so, me? Yes, I can. Yeah, absolutely. I would like, I would like to see that, yes. Definitely. Yeah. yeah uh, so, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Bismillah. I'm, I'm interested in what you're saying. So keep going. Yeah. So that's uh, one of the ways of increasing oxygen in the body because essentially, if you increase oxygen in the body, it will automatic your body will get rid of diseases and it won't uh, pathogens and diseases won't be able to flourish inside of an oxygenated body. So. Another thing we can take is uh, ozone water. I don't know if you're familiar with ozone water. Ozone, okay. Yeah, th this will help also get rid of free radicals and bacteria in the gut. I wonder if you read ozone. Quran on that type of water or the one you were mentioning before, if you read Quran on that and then drank it, how much more powerful it would be. Yes, I believe it would be very much more powerful. Very because much. oxygen is energy, right? And it would like... Uh, yes, even uh, the, the increase of oxygen in the blood will give you more energy as well. Yes, you will be more energetic you, and you will feel it. Like you will even be able to stay up longer at night. You won't need um, as much sleep as well. So, alhamdulillah. But yeah. I, I don't want to take up too much time because I know other people have questions, but those, those yeah. were just a few things a I text. wanted to add. Send me a text. Okay, I got you, Sheikh. Jazakallah khair. Okay, no problem. Uh, okay, um, is it IS or JS? Um, Salam alaikum, Sheikh. Thank you very much for the for the video. You're welcome, very much. Yes. Yeah, so I have a question: Is a raqi allowed to do istana with other jinn to heal the person, or is, no. is that permissible in Islam or not? No, not allowed. Strictly, no. So the way I like to tell it is if it's a Muslim jinn, 
You say to the Muslim jinn, if you want to do it, if you want to do something for the sake of Allah, you do it. But I'm not seeking your help. And uh, you can command them as a human being, meaning uh, you can command them if you want something done, but you're not. It's, it has to be clear that this is not you asking isti'ana. Isti'ana is shirk, shirk, shirk. Okay. And the Quran mentions this in Sutul Jinn. So, you know, there's a fine line where it becomes confusing. Like you have a jinn that's your friend and you might ask him like a friend, can you do this? Because you've done, let's say, 10 cases and every time you do a case, he comes up. Uh, this is very common for Raqis that the same jinn that's following you will come up because he just likes helping you or a group of jinns that like helping you. And so you might say one day like, okay, I, can you just tell me where that bad jinn is in the body? So I'll just like, poke it right now and that could be to some degree okay after a few times only because it's clear in that relationship but especially in the beginning like sometimes even the devils they'll say well if you ask me for my permission i'll do this for you no you can't do that you cannot ask for help anything in the unseen not even your own angels i see okay so okay, the way I like you. to do it is I tell the brothers around me that do ruqya is that you can say, if you want to do this for the sake of Allah, then you do it. Meaning if a jinn says, oh, um, there's a jinn in his feet, as an example. And now the good jinn is like, there's a jinn in his feet. Uh, and now you want to say to him, okay, can you like go kill him? Okay. So you don't have to say it like that. That go uh, go kill him is okay too because it's a command, but don't ask for help. So you could say something like, "I'm going to read Quran. I'm going to start reading Quran on the feet, and if you want to help for the sake of Allah, that's on you. Then that's okay." Okay, thank you very much, Sheikh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think Elias was next, and then brother uh, Doctor Imtiaz after that. Hi, Assalamualaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam. My name is I'm Elias. Uh, I have a question about uh, because it was also about the full moon, and uh, I recently did a certificate for hijama. Oh, okay, so there, there there seems to be some connection. Yeah, yeah, that's why I also want there is to some connection because the best time to do hijama is in the full moon, in the middle yeah, of. Yeah, that's moon. what I just wanted to share. Uh, I don't I know. Why? But there seems to be some connection. Allah knows best. Yeah. Yeah. So what I uh, learned is that uh, I'm from Holland, the Netherlands. So I don't know really the English word, but we call it apflut, like the when the moon it has effect on the sea, right? So then all the the sticks and all that actually sort of junk from the sea is like on the on the sand, right? Mm. Yeah, like so. With the full moon, it has effect on the water, and we are also uh, so many percent of water. Yeah, so it has sort of the same effect. Like that's why the whole beach is in full with sticks and leaves and blah blah blah. And that that's what why the teacher made the connection. Allah alam, but it's very interesting. Is that the same thing that happens in the in the body? Because mm -hmm. also with full moon. Uh, the most murders are also being then committed. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, there, again, you know, the, the gut has a relationship with the brain and the parasites act out the most during the full moon. So if the gut yeah. affects the brain, then if the gut is affected by um, the moon, then that's going to affect your brain and how you behave. Yes. Well, then it's interesting is that because after that, because those days are then after the full moon. So then the blood has all this junk then, and then you do hijama. So then you take that out of the body. So it's very interesting how, yeah, how, uh, how that is connected to with the full moon. And then you do hijama because then like the same thing, it's like you clean up the beach with all this stuff. It's the same thing, but then we have it still in our body, but hijama then really takes it out in the best way, actually. So yeah, that's uh, interesting. Uh, I just wanted to share it. And I also had a question. Uh, I did the hijama course, and I only, I don't know, do you, you do hijama or you, you are 
learned in that? Because no, I, do, I do hijama, but uh yeah, like what well, what is it? Because the teacher taught us only to recite then Fatiha. And the other one, like the one who is having the hijama, like the uh, not, not a patient, but just the one you're doing it on. He then recite Fatiha and Ayat al Kursi. But do you know any other better? Or is that it really in a Sahih Hadith like something else what was done? Meaning the Prophet didn't recite anything. You just say Bismillah and you do it. But the, uh, the, as the science of hijama developed and people realized that a lot of the hijama is not just the physical disease, but a lot of the hijama relates to the jinn and that. So because of that, they started adding dhikr or ayat of Quran to the hijama process. So, okay. uh, yeah. So that's how it kind of like developed. So just doing it is actually also good. But is it then not like that? The Fatiha then isn't that then like extra? Fatiha extra? Is one, of, one of the best du'as you can do in terms of Rukia. And if you want to add something to it from the Quran, you can add something to it from the Quran. There's no like nothing stopping. Yeah. I would prefer to I, I, like if it was me, I might do more of the verses that will bring them out, for example, and not let them leave the body, for example. But that's a little bit more advanced. So, for example, I was like to not let them leave. Uh, yeah, to make them come present during that time. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I might start reading verses like that, depending upon what I see in the patient. If I see the person's blood is normal, the patient is normal, then, then you just do your normal dhikr. But if I start seeing that, wait, the guy is like being seriously affected right now and, you know, saying funny things, then I start reading according to what I'm listening Okay, have you seen it already? Like other, I only see now. Like, like you will definitely like see that, amazing but... things as you do uh, hijama on people. Just wait okay. till you've done about a hundred. You'll definitely have some stories by that time. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. And also, very important that you do if you're doing hijama, that you're protecting yourself because if people yeah. have issues, those issues might, you know, affect you too. So just be careful yeah. about. We try to have uh, voodoo and uh, yeah, yeah, pray at least whatever I had to pray. So I had did I have done my door or if it's then and have uh, the last time I also yeah I did voodoo and then helped him. But uh, yeah, it is very interesting by the way that not a lot of Muslims have done it. I don't know why, but like these people are fifty years old and they have never done it or forty years old. So it's very a lost sunnah, actually. We were, uh, yeah, it was a lot. It is a lost sunnah still, and uh, it's because we were so hypnotized by modern Western medicine and all their explanations. We were so uh, dazzled yeah. by what the West had to offer that it's only now that when they start, when now they're using our methods and they start doing hijama, we're like, okay, wait, you know. Yeah. We don't, so. But with some, I even have to convince them. They're really looking at me like, you know, is it real? I think it's just, you know, is it really helping? They really. So once you get your first patient that has diabetes or something like that, and they've done hijama several times, and they're like, yeah, my diabetes is better, then you know, you then you let the people know. They can talk to this brother. I did hijama on him, and now he's doing much better because of his hijama. Yeah, I hope, inshallah. Yeah. It is a lot sunnah, and that's why, yeah, we should try really to revive it. And uh, but also, it's very connected also with the food. So this is a very interesting topic. And the jinn food, yeah, hijama. I think like the whole thing is super connected, and uh, it's very interesting to study this now, hijama. So for everyone here in the chat, like it is not difficult at all to be honest and uh, to learn that. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, brother. Dr. Imtiaz, I would like to know your thoughts. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. I hope you are doing well. I hope you're doing well. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. 
Okay, few things regarding this hijama. Yeah. Uh, just listen to that brother uh, what I was saying. Actually, it's related to a high tide and low tide. See, during full moon, we have full full tide, or high tide. Okay. So this is scientifically, I mean, like uh, it doesn't explain. So you know, like when you have full moon, have high tide, the water in our body gets, you know, like pulled toward the skins. And when that happens, the toxins in the body, you know, just goes and reside, get clings to the skin. And we do the hijama on the skin. So then that's the reason it's very effective during a full moon when you do hijama. Hmm. Okay, that's one of the explanations. Okay. And, okay. Okay. And previously, uh, um, the brother who was uh, discussing about hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide, okay, um, it, it's it's uh, it's a very good solution, but it's very risky. So if you ingest hyd hydrogen peroxide, whether it's thirty five percent or three percent, at, at least there has to be three hours difference between your food, okay, and one hour after uh, ingesting hydro hydrogen peroxide and the next food or drinks. Okay, can you repeat but, that but, again but, so that everyone's clear on that? Yeah, like let's say uh, if you're taking hydrogen peroxide, 35% food grade or 3%, if you're ingesting it by uh, orally, then it has to be, there has to be a three hours gap between your food and the first dose. Okay, and when you have, let's say you're taking at 10 o'clock, 10 a.m., then 7 a.m., you should have your breakfast. And then next uh, food or drink, you should have it at 11 a.m. So this is the precaution you have to take. Otherwise, it'll, it'll be in diff diff difficult, like it'll be in a, a deep trouble. It'll be in hospital, emergency room. Okay, okay. Okay. Then um, that's the case. Our, the, the most easiest or the best way of doing it is like you take a spray bottle, add 3% hydrogen peroxide, and just spray it in a mouth. That's much more better. So you don't have to you know, like worry about eating food or drinking anything. Hmm. That's more is easiest way of doing it. Okay. okay. That's about hydrogen peroxide and uh, uh, hijama. Okay, Let, let's come to gene. Okay, gene and parasite. See, according to my research and my like team, whatever. Yeah, that's account, why I want to know because I know you're hmm. looking into this very strongly. Yeah. yeah. So what happened actually, um, I, I think I call uh, gene as the my macro parasite. I've done some research on the uh, uh, parasite. Like parasites are like everything, which takes all your food, nutrient, everything, but doesn't give you anything in return. It just steals your food and it kills you. It's not like probiotics. They have a symbiosis life, hmm. a symbiotic life. They take something from us, but they give us something in return. But the parasites, they just, just they just take it, they, but don't don't give anything in return. So then this shayatin. Gene, they are actually parasites, but the bigger one, the macro one. Mm. And they control the micro ones, like uh, the fungi, viruses, uh, protozoa, uh, whatever, fungus, uh, uh, bacteria. Okay. Now, how, how, how do you think um, a gene is a parasite? Because, you know, genes are made of fire. Yeah. Gene, genes are made of fire. So what does a fire need? Fire need oxygen to survive, to burn. Yeah, yeah. Right. So when when they and, and you know what is oxygen? Oxygen is a nutrient. It's a it's a nutrient. It's a mm. food which you need to survive. Okay. You, okay. you need to live. Okay. Now when gene when the gene gets inside our body, they sucks all our oxygen. Okay. Okay. That's how hypoxia happens. Okay. That's so how hypoxia gene, happens. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I got it. That's a Okay, now when these genes flow in the uh, blood, okay, as per Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the gene flows in our, in our blood, right? So wh whenever they flow in a blood, they suck all the oxygen. There is a doctor, German doctor called uh, Joanna Budwig. Okay. She is a specialist in cancer, you know, like she is in like passed away now. She has done a couple of research and she found that. Uh, there's a different difference between the blood of a normal person and a person with cancer. Okay. okay. So the, the blood of a cancer uh, patient is like green, devoid of oxygen, and the red blood cell has like collapsed. And the normal patient, it, it's fully red and, you know, like vibrant, uh, normal, vibrant. normal blood flow, flow yeah, no, normal yeah. flow of blood. Okay. So, uh, and full of oxygen. 
So these are different. And we also found that yes, uh, cancer is a gene position. Not only cancer, like, like almost 90% of diseases caused by gene, mm. but cancer is a very severe, severe case. Mm. That's what we have found. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we have done lots of, I cannot say, uh, like uh, so many things to be, you know, to be said. I can, it's not possible in a short period of yeah, time. I need to do a so, podcast uh, just with you. And, uh, yeah, inshallah, like, inshallah. Teach- um, yeah, maybe one or two hour I'll do a absolutely, like, absolutely, Inshallah. absolutely. Yeah. So like you know, like it's about positive ion and negative ion. Any any chemical, you know, uh, compound, they are made of they have two things like positive cation and anion. Okay. So you know, like the shad in genes, they are positive ion and 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 uh, and uh, you no, know, like the opposite that is negative ion. Okay. Um you know, there is a surah in Quran. Uh, can you please open that particular uh, surah? Sure, it's, absolutely. It's, uh, surah Anfal, ayat number 11. Surah Anfal, ayat number 11. Okay. Yes. Very interesting. Okay. Yeah, surah ayat number 11. Please, uh, yeah, it's written here. I say, I'm not able to read the uh, Arabic word, but it's written. Is, is um, um, yeah. When you were put to no. sleep, when you were overcome with like uh, sleep, aminatan in tranquility, minhu, wa yunazilu alikum in sama'i ma'an, and the rain came down to you from the sky, liutahirukum wa yudhib ankum rijsa shaitan. Oh, I get it. Okay, okay. 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 So Allah says, Do away Quran, with the ridge of shaitan, the, the filth of shaitan, the pollution. Hmm. Ridge, it, ridge is an interesting word because it literally means pollution. It literally means your, yes, the, yes. the ugliness of. Yes. So basically, well, it's, it's, ala it's the... and as a result of the physical manifestation of the rain and cleaning of the shaitan, your hearts became stronger. And your feet became firm. This is actually a very interesting ayah. Thank you very much. But I want to see so, what you think. Yeah, Sheikh, uh, sorry. Um, so this particular thing, Allah says that, uh, you know, like uh, he, he sends down water from the sky to clean the uh, all, all the pollutions created by Saturn, okay. So Saturn is basically, you know, like the positive ion and, and, and this rainwater is a negative ion. Mm. And you can get negative ion in near lots of, uh, like waterfall, um, the trees, park, so many uh, things are there, okay. So uh, when this shayatin, you know, they enter the body, this positive uh, ion, they mix our body very acidic. You know, okay. negative ion is alkaline. Yeah. So that's how we get the cancer. So I don't want to go in detail right now. And it's, it's a, it will have very big explanations. So that's mm. how things happen. Interesting. Mashallah, mashallah. At and, least we have and, people in the ummah who know, who understand this. That's good. And some more thing. Yeah, uh, regarding this yeah, particular, see, our, our, uh, regarding that magnesium and iron, hemoglobin, CO2 medicine and bicarbonates. These are particular uh, things you know like required to combat the shayatin genes. Mm. Okay, why? Because uh, this bicarbonates, the bicarbonates is like a double-edged sword. You know, it's uh, it's oxygenates the body as well as alkalinizes the body. Okay, so it, it's it's it, it's provide oxygen as well as carbon dioxide. Hmm. You know, you know what kills a fire? It's carbon dioxide which kills the fire, and you need oxygen to burn burn the fire. Okay, so carbon dioxide bicarbonates it provides oxygen to your healthy the thing, and carbon dioxide maybe they kills the gene, shayatin genes. That's why when I was doing the uh, immuno oncology courses with, you know, the uh, with the Harvard Harvard scientist, you know, they themselves have accepted that in order to, you know. Normalize the cell, cell, the circadian rhythm, circadian rhythm of the cell, because the cancer cell they eat 24 hours, not like not like normal cells. They, it should according to natural fitra, you know, like how Allah Subhanahu has programmed the normal cell should eat 12 hours and sleep for 12 hours. Okay, mm-hmm. they should not eat. But when when the cancer cell, you know, the 
the cell become cancer they eat 24 hours so in that oh, in order to okay i see okay. what you did it's like yeah. really this, okay okay i get it so <laughs> yeah so the, the scientists were discussing that in order to uh, um, rectify that problem you must take bicarbonates so there are several bicarbonates are available like magnesium bicarbonate uh, potassium, potassium bicarbonate and sodium bicarbonates okay mm. so these bicarbonates actually is basically a co2 medicine okay okay it produces so if you do not have actually we think that oxygen is our life and even co2 is also our life life giving uh, gas so if if a person is deficient of oxy, uh, oxygen as well as carbon dioxide they'll have big problem you're right so you need i was thinking that oxygen is good and carbon dioxide is bad but what you're saying is no 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 you're both, 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 both are, are important okay yes okay both are important things okay right so, yeah so 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 what happened you, 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 hemoglobin you know like the blood the blood need hemoglobin to carry the oxygen okay and you need b12 iron so that's the reason when you have somebody is affected with gene you need to have give them iron supplement b12 supplement folates okay and you need magnesium magnesium magnesiums they increases the oxygen carrying capability of hemoglobin okay okay so this is one of the reason why you need a uh, magnesium okay so these are all interrelated these are so all interrelated yeah, it's it's all yeah, yeah. one organic whole uh, i think one of the sisters because there's a separate group of brothers and a separate group of sisters mm -hmm. and one of the sisters saying can we have a group where the brothers and sisters are together at least you know it's where they can ask you questions but what i'll request you is if you can do a every day just every day a 30 second voice message and then i can send that to my different groups i don't know if that's too much to ask but if me if, yes uh, every day i go whenever I'll every time, day I'll uh, a few times a week <laughs> so definitely definitely and then i'll send and that then, to the sisters and i'll send that to the brothers and then you know definitely inshallah inshallah yeah and also uh, Sheikh, uh, we have found that any virus not only that any pathogen they are ph sensitive like they cannot survive in an alkaline environment so if you make the body hostile to them they will leave whether it's a gene or whether it's any kind of pathogen they will leave they will die wait zamzam water is also alkaline right pardon yes, zamzam yes, water yes. is uh, alkaline it's, it's alkana and i have the document research paper with me to prove it that it is uh, alkaline 7.4 the ph uh, level of our blood is 7.4 and the ph of zamzam water is 7.4 so you just by drinking uh, zamzam water you can cure uh, cancer inshallah very good just by drinking zamzam water mashallah mashallah okay i'm learning uh, we have proof yeah we have proof we have documents it's not like just assumption or something like that we have pay on paper it's a done mm. research it's a done by uh, do doctors and scientists okay mashallah all and right you know like i think yeah it's okay it's fine <laughs> yeah i know you we have to do a podcast together to you know inshallah inshallah <laughs> Brother Abu Daud or Brother Abu Rashid, you had something to say? Uh, no, I think we are good. Just to we'll, uh, mention one thing. Uh, uh, the, the hydrogen peroxide, food get hydrogen peroxide is available in the market. This is good for, I, I tried it before to make the body alkaline. It works perfect. Uh, I also, I like to mention to Dr. Imtia that he mentioned about a right machine to me before. Uh, I did purchase one of them and trying to learn about it. Seems like very promising to me. Uh, I'm really grateful to Dr. Imtiaz with that. So what did he uh, tell you to purchase that was beneficial? It's a Rife machine. It's a Rife. machine uh, Dr. Rife created way back in 1940s uh, okay. uh, to kill the cancer pathogens. So what I understand that this has a frequencies uh, that can kill the actual gene. Uh, it has a, but it need to know, you need to know the right frequency and, and know how to utilize this. Uh, so I'm still on learning process. Uh, but, what is it but called? It, Rife, R-I-F-E. Rife, Rife, Rife uh, what? Rife, Rife machine, you can say Rife machine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So... Uh, this this has a different different um, techniques, different different modules it has, but it is a, one of the one of the 
best instrument I have seen uh, in, in, in my lifetime. Okay, so this can treat cancer, but it also kills jinns. That makes sense. Yeah, it has a plasma module, which is the best one to killing. There was a, a Bengali brother, I forget his name right now, mashallah. He wrote a book about how to cure cancer. And, you know, he was saying all those things that you would need to, like in, in talking about curing cancer, it was like he was talking about how to kill jinns. You know, much of it was like that. Um Okay, thank you very much. And I think it'll be good for the people to see this too. But you have to kind of like learn how to use this, right? It's like yes, not, yes, very, yes, yes. not a very simple... Um, no, no, it, need, it has a module within to connect with computer and need to know the right, uh, right frequencies. Okay, very good, mashallah. Okay, uh, I think it would be Sister Razia. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, assalamu alaikum. I can hear you. Wa alaikum salam. Um, but with someone, I've had the cancer back about two, five years ago. So can I explain how I got cured? Oh, yes, absolutely. And you will be our last uh, uh, dialogue for the day, inshallah. I have to go and pray. Okay. Um, went to, did the chemo about three times, but then my son uh, found the um, another gentleman who was getting treated by a naturopathic doctor and um, he told um, told me to uh, see him, he would push me and said no you have to get treatment for him, I called him over and um, he sat down and explained for, for about seven hours, sorry I'm a bit tired today so I'm breathing heavily. Um, he said, basically, your cancers come from an increase of parasites in the body. Number mm. two, they're from, a lot of cancers come from infected teeth. Now, this doctor has been treating cancer for years, autism for years, 25 years experience. So he gave me the Siberian cedarwood oil, basically pure gum turpentine from the pine tree. Repeat that again so I can hear and my audience can hear. What did he give you? He gave pure gum turpentine, pure turpentine from the pine tree. Okay. So you can, you can, uh, you can get it like mixed with cedar oil, it, you, pine oil, you can also buy, but pine oil and turpentine are similar, but turpentine is processed differently than pine oil you can buy pure turpentine online and all you need to do is take a third of a teaspoon a day with your food and juice and take it for seven days stop for seven days so that the parrots it kills parasites but you stop for seven days so the other parasite eggs hatch the worms the microscopic worms in your body and then after a seven day break, you take it again for seven days and that kills the rest of the parasites. Now, Africa, I've, I've, I've heard from African communities used to use this a lot for hundreds of years, pure gum turpentine. And it works, it used to kill all the diseases in African communities. How do you spell Without gum? G-U-M? Yes, gum. But I buy pure turpentine in a large amount, but usually, because people are worried what, what it is, they think it's the, oh, it only cleans paints. I, uh, you, you buy, you can buy uh, one product called Diamond G Pure Turpentine, which is only a small bottle, but I buy a large litre bottle of 100% pure turpentine on eBay from Maynard's company, Maynard's Pure Turpentine, because I have to give it the whole family. So everyone take it. It extended the family. And you only take a small amount for pe for young small children, because it's really, really strong. You take, you can rub it with castor oil onto their stomach, onto their belly button, because belly button massage okay. is an ancient is an ancient treatment so okay okay uh, you're you were you're talking about two things so one is you would take it 
for oh, seven days. Have, and how much would you take? A teaspoon, or how much would you take? You take half a teaspoon. Half a teaspoon for seven days, and then not and then for seven second, days, and, and then, then again for seven days. Seven days. Okay. And then the second thing you said is to rub it on the belly button of the children. Sorry, can you repeat? The second was to rub it on the stomach of the children. Yes, because it's quite strong. So anything rubbed into the belly button. Now, this is ancient medicine used for thousands of years. My grandma taught me, she goes, always put oil, massage into your belly button. You'll feel better. Now, anything that goes into your belly now, did button. Did you say to rub with uh, castor oil? And yes, that together? Turpentine, okay. turpentine is garam, hot, and castor oil is cool. So you're balancing both of them out. Okay. Got it. Thank you very much. I think people will benefit from that. Dr. Mtiaz, do you have something to add to that? And Hello? Then, Hello? Sister Hello? Razia, did that? Yes, Dr. Mtiaz. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what she said is uh, fine, it's right, but there is another easy way of doing it using Islamic medicine, herbal medicine. Like you can take um, wormwood and then black seed oil along with olive leaf extract, olive, uh, like, um, olive oils. So there's a different way, there's a different protocol available for this parasite killing. So if you can kill this parasite, definitely you can cure cancer. But there's lots of, um, how do you think, uh, but it's not only parasite, but there are other things like alcohol, sugar, things are, these are involved. So you have to break the chain. Once you break the chain, then you can um, cure the cancer. So but Sister Razia, how long were you doing this treatment for before he got rid of all the parasites and everything? Um, well, he gave me a hundred mil bottle and I was taking it on and off for about six months. Wow, okay. Okay. And um, and parasites feed off sugar, so sugar is what makes them increase. They love their sugar. So sometimes they in in African medicine they say take a teaspoon of sugar with the turpentine because the sh sugar makes the parasites come out of the brain, the pancreas, the uterus, and then the turpentine kills it. So they said to take it with sugar or without sugar. The naturopath doctor didn't yeah. mention sugar, but the African med Africans do take it with a teaspoon of sugar. Okay, okay, okay. That's right. That's right. Uh, um, that's that's a good idea because it's like you know it's, it's putting a Trojan horse. Just um, make you know they like sugar. This cancer cell parasite they like sugar, so you mix uh, honey or sugar, and you like uh, then you send this particular um, um, what do you call. It? This medicine along with that. So they think they're going to eat the sugar and they on this part, this particular medicine go inside their thing and they die. They, they get blasted, yeah. Wow, it, like that's like, wow, okay. That's like can killing the shaitan with a trick. Yeah, yes, can, yes. I, can I include parasites are major causes of diseases, but because turpentine is cheap, that's why a big pharma hidden Turpentine cure is for not for cancer, it's for every disease. Most diseases are caused by parasites. Mm. They're caused by para depression, parasites in the brain, insulin, insulin, diabetes, parasites in the pancreas, fibroids in the uterus, parasites in the uterus, many diseases. And can I go back to the cancer bit? One other thing he yeah, said. Absolutely, yes infected teeth he he said um, most many diseases he goes hundreds of years ago back in the 1800s you could say if a patient was ill the doctor would send him to the tooth doctor who would take his tooth out or cure his tooth and the, and the illness would go away so every time a patient was ill he'd send him to the dentist the tooth doctor saw his teeth out and he'd get better. <coughs> hmm. Hundreds of thousand diseases are from, come back to the teeth. It's from hmm. the teeth, infected teeth and, and um, lots of teeth problems can cause the illness in the body, including cancer. Okay. Very good, mashallah. So you have a lot of experience in this too, mashallah. That's very good. Um, this is the type of stuff that the ummah needs to learn and kind of like open themselves up to. 
And uh, so inshallah, maybe Allah is opening doors if Allah wills. Okay, thank you everyone. Jazakumullah khairan. I hope this was something that benefits all of you and uh, and is a reward for you in the next life, inshallah. Okay, assalamu alaikum everyone. Alaikum assalamu alaikum. How to contact Sister Razia? Somebody's asking how to contact you, Sister. So if Sister Razia is listening to this and she's not able to speak, but if somebody who knows her maybe, then get her in, talk, in touch with me and then we'll try to figure things out. Um, maybe we can talk about her experience and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, inshallah. As-salamu alaykum.